Hey, this is Leach with Simpson Math, and in this video, we'll be taking a look at seven of our parent functions. In the next several videos, we will be transforming and moving around these seven parent functions, so it'll be important that we get a good, solid grasp on them. By the end of the video, you'll know the name of the parent functions, uh, how to recognize them by a formula as well, by table, and ultimately, most importantly, by their graphs and how to graph them. We'll also be talking about the domain and range for each. To help us out today, we'll be using the free online graphing software Desmos. You can find it at desmos.com, D-E-S-M-O-S. -S. It's also available as a free app on your phone or tablet. You can just download it, download it for free. Uh, also, I'll be uh, then documenting uh, what we discovered on our, from the graphing software on the notes to the right. So let's get started with uh, the linear function. So first up, before we actually start graphing, it's important to note about the window that I'm wanting. At minimum, when we graph, I would like to see your graphs go from negative 10 to 10 in most cases. So our x, the smallest, uh, the smallest x is uh, negative 10, and the biggest x is positive 10. Same thing for the y's, negative 10 to 10. Makes a nice square. Um, so also, whenever we graph our values, make sure that it's accurate out through all of those values. So if you need to add more points than I recommend, then add more points than I recommend. So with the linear function, that is just y equals x or f of x equals x. So let me just turn this on by clicking the circle. It just activates it. I already had it typed in. So I, I've typed this in in function notation. You should be familiar with function notation. So f of x equals x. And so the way that this works is well, there's nothing else with our function notation or nothing else on this right side of the equal sign. It's just x. So that means that uh, whatever our input is, that's also our output. So if I just plug in a 5, a 5 should pop out. There we go. If I plug in a negative 3, a negative 3 should pop out eventually. Um, same thing with our x and y intercept at 0, 0. So uh, I had this programmed so that, that way it'll pop up some of our nice dots. So you can see right here with the way this negative 3 works, if I plug in negative 3 into x, this is an ordered pair x comma y, I've just told Desmos to figure out whatever f of negative 3 is. I say, hey, Desmos, evaluate f of negative 3. And Desmos goes, oh, well, that's also negative 3. So it's graphing negative 3 comma negative 3. And it put it on the graph right there. There we go. Uh, same thing with these, uh, all these other points. You can see that all of these, whoops, lost some of them. All of these are uh, the same inputs, same outputs. So these, this is the most of these dots are what we should put on the table. Actually, I'm only going to require negative two to two because it gets quite redundant. Um, but me, I'm not. I don't always draw the straightest of lines, so I often will um, maybe include five five and then also ten ten as well, just so that we have something to aim for. All right. So now let's talk about domain and range. So the domain, that's the set of all x's. So it's the set of all x's from negative infinity to positive infinity. So it's wherever we define our x's. So all x's, uh, what we need to do is, is you need to say where the uh, say where the x values are. Same thing for the y. The y is the range. So it's where are the those y values. Just a little trick the way that I, that I remember this. Uh, I remember the movie Lion King. When Mufasa takes Simba to the very, very top part that you're like, how did they get up there to the top of Pride Rock? And he says, Simba, everything that this, the light touches will one day be yours or something like that. Uh, he, in that case, he's saying, look at all of the, look at all the land, look at everything that's on the ground. Uh, you're going to be the king of your domain. This is going to be your domain, your rule over this. He's talking about the ground, everything that the light touches that ground. I know that's silly, but that's the way that works. Uh, at least in my brain. For range, I always think about it uh, in terms of Price is Right. I always love, there's a uh, big fan of Price is Right. There's a game called Range Finder. Simple pricing game, usually for like a car uh, or bedroom furniture or something. Um, so they have a range and it like ticks up and the, the contestants have to hit a button and it will stop, stop it. And if their price is within that range, that interval from low to high, uh, then they win the car. So I think about Price is Right and Lion King for range and domain. So looking at, at this graph, the there's nothing that's going to stop this dot from going all the way to the left forever and ever, and then all the way to the right forever and ever. It's just going to go forever and ever in terms of left and right. 
and then uh, up and down is going to do the same thing down forever and ever and up forever and ever so let's take a look let's fill in our table and then write down our domain and range all right so I filled in our information on here we can see three of our four representations that I mentioned today so we have the name linear function we have the equation f of x equals x uh, and then we have the table so I've added the table and you can see our ordered pairs here so this is negative 2 comma negative 2 but instead of writing them as a bunch of ordered pairs uh, I'm putting them in this t table uh, I need to graph it I'll do that in just a second and then we have our domain and range down there I'll talk more about what that how that domain and range works and uh, all those funny symbols in just a second um, but let's go ahead and get this get this graphed so whenever I graph this I'm going to start with my five points so I'm at zero zero I'm going to put it I put a dot at zero zero now that bothers some students because they're like why are you starting in the middle why aren't you starting at the top of this well I like to start at zero zero that's our origin that's where all the action kind of like in my brain like comes from so I always start at zero zero so I put my I put a uh, dot right there at zero zero and then I'm just my brain likes to work towards the positive so that's what I do so I'm going to graph at 1, 1. Let me zoom in a little bit just so you're clear what I'm doing. I'm going to go uh, looking for my origin. I'm going to go over 1, up 1, and put a dot there at 1, 1, 1, comma 1. And then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do the same thing for 2, 2. So over 2, up 2, I'm going to put a dot there at 2, 2. Uh, and then this quickly now for negative 1, 1, negative 2, 2, we can get those other dots. Like I said, I don't have the, the straightest of hands sometimes. So I'm going to also graph a negative 5, positive 5, and then do negative 10, positive 10. I'm going to use this dummy up to make sure I get to the right spot. Yep, I'm going to put it right there. Oops, didn't grab the pin. There we go. All right, do the same thing down here. All right. So there we have it. So we have our dots. Uh, I'm just going to now draw a line through them. I'm going to probably cheat and use there's actually a line tool here. It'll more or less straighten it out for me a little bit. So there we go. Now, if you were if this was what you were to graph, I like what you have here. I see my dots and I see some extra dots. That's nice. There's one crucial thing that's missing, and that's arrows. I need to see absolute requirement. I need to see. Let me make that a little bit prettier. I need to see arrows at the ends of the lines, uh, into the lines in the curves. That's the reason why is because um, I need you. I need to know that you know one that the graph keeps going, and when it doesn't, because there's sometimes that it doesn't, and then also kind of in the direction that it's heading. Uh, so again, like I said, make sure that your graph is accurate all the way to the end, including these arrows. All right. So now let's talk about uh, this domain and range business. So I'm gonna. Uh, so just to be clear. Um, I said earlier that domain it's a set of X's so imagine when you're talking about domain that there is some industrial presses have you ever seen those videos on YouTube where they have those big really expensive machines big heavy things and they crush stuff you're like there's things it's like there's no way that that thing is gonna crush like a battery or something or some other metal and it just gets flat like a pancake that's what I think about so imagine that uh, you had some industrial press that pressed this function onto the x-axis where in the where on that x-axis uh, will there be data points or x values well in terms of the domain it's going to be all the way from the smallest to the biggest or just all possible numbers all real numbers um, so that's that's what both of these things say and then when it comes to range I my brain always thinks of Beauty and the Beast but just, if you think of a library or the library scene of Beauty and the Beast and there's bookends, big elaborate bookends, well, just imagine that they're uh, bookends and they're pressing everything in as tightly as possible um, towards the middle. So again, we're going to press everything in towards the middle here. Uh, and when it does, we're going to figure out where, the, uh, where there are values, where their Y values are, and that's what our range is. So let's talk about these, this notation a little bit. So there's two different notations. There's what I call the interval notation, and there's what's called the set notation. If I ask you, hey, what's the domain and range, and that's all I say, you can pick interval or you can pick set. Um, please don't give me both unless you're confident that they're both right. 
Um, so, but you get to pick if I uh, if I don't tell you which way. I mean, you could give me interval there and set from that one and we call it good. Uh, but if I say, uh, give it to me in interval, then you better give it to me in this form and not that form. Likewise, if I say, give me set, it better be in this form and not interval notation. So you do need to know both and you do need to know them both by name. Now, again, these are two separate things, two separate ways to say the same thing. Um, they don't have to be written together. Um, so just so, just so we're clear on that. All right, so let's talk about interval notation a little bit. So first up, uh, an interval, let me actually come over here first. An interval, it's an interval. I'm literally saying from negative infinity, so from all the way as far uh, left as we could ever possibly go, and then two, all the way to biggest infinity, all the way to the right as far as we could possibly go. So it's an interval, so that means it must, must be written low to high. Students will often switch these, uh, and they'll give me the high number and then the low number. That is incorrect. So one way to think about this, so imagine, think, I have college algebra from 8 o'clock in the morning to 9.15 in the morning. That makes sense. From 8 in the morning to 9.15. You would not say you're, that you're in college algebra from 9.15 in the morning until 8 in the morning. One, in the way time works, it makes it sound like that you're in college algebra for almost 23 hours, and that's very false. Um, so no, it's this, it's the low value to the high value. It's from here to there. So make sure that we uh, say the smallest one first. All right, and then what about around around these? So both of these have parentheses. Later in this video, you'll see square brackets from some. Um, the parentheses, they act kind of like boundaries. Um, so it's like the uh, the less than, less than or greater than, or an, or an open circle, or just a dotted line. Uh, all those act as boundaries, if you're familiar with those in other contexts in math, where it's plain that I'm not touching you, I'm not touching you, I'm not touching you, I'm not touching you again. You can almost imagine that that's what the parentheses is doing. If I have a number line, let's put one right here, if I have a number line, tick, 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 and I put a parenthesis, it's plain that I'm not touching you. It's like, oh, I'm almost getting there. But the square bracket, it is it is touching. It's not, it's not being the annoying child. It's just saying, I'm going to touch you, which might be also like an annoying child. So you can see visually like the number line, it is on it. It is right smack dab on it. And we call these square brackets. Now, in algebra context, if I was if this was an equation of and I was doing distribution or something, parentheses, square brackets, eh, same difference. In this context, in terms of interval notation, they they are very uh, they're they're different. So make sure that you make them clear. Also, just make sure that your parentheses and square brackets are notably different. Make sure that your square brackets are square. I'll see some where it's like starts a square bracket and ends as a parenthesis, or they're just sort of kind of like wiggle wiggles or something odd. Uh, that's like, is that a square bracket or something? And if you make a mistake, you need to change it, erase it. Please don't try to just draw over it. If I don't know which one it is, then I'm going to grade it wrong. Uh, so make sure that it's clear whether it's a square bracket or parentheses. The square brackets are like the equal twos uh, of the sets. They're touching it, so the equal, less than or equal to, greater than or equal to. It's like a dot where it's touching it, or, or a line where it's that boundary. So it's the equal to that's touching. So that's interval notation, low to high, and you have to be mindful about the uh, the ends. And we'll see some examples of that in a minute. All right, so for set notation, you are making a set. Um, so these brackets don't signify a start and an end to like a boundary or anything like that. No, no, no. All this is saying is just that it's containing the set. So it's start defining, here's the start of my definition of the set. Here's the end of the definition of the set. That's all that's happening. So it just signifies the set. And so then here's some other symbols. Um, well, one, we'll be using inequality symbols. So you should be friends with that. We'll see some in a minute. We'll be using the inequality symbols. Uh, but just in this thing alone, you're like, what is this? What is this, perhaps? So, well, first, we should see this, this symbol. It's... Uh, looks like an E. You draw it by like drawing a C with a line in the middle of it. All right, let me do that again. Draw it like a C, uh, like a lowercase C with a line in the middle of it. Um, please do not get creative and try to draw the E like that, uh, or just a capital E, um, or some other thing. I don't know. It's weird. Students have in the past have tried to get creative. I'm like, no, no, no. It's a symbol. That is what the symbol is. Please don't change it. 
So two different ways you can think of it. You can think of it fancily as an element of, or it's just it is in. It is that like x is in something, is inside of something. Now what is it often inside of or part of? Uh, this double bar r. This is the real number set. So you draw draw two vertical lines pretty close together, and then just draw a capital R. Uh, if this capital R swoops, if it swoops over uh, to that first one, that's okay. It can go to the first one or stop at the first one or the second one. It's okay. So double bar R, uh, double bar capital R. So that particular thing, it's sort of kind of emulating. Imagine that if this was like filled in, uh, this could be extra fancy R, especially if this was thicker here, thicker here. So it's sort of kind of emulating a fancy uh, block R with really thick writing, uh, but it does it with like those empty pieces and we just do it on that one side. So that's why there's two lines. It's sort of kind of making it nice and thick. So what this is talking about, it's talking about the real number set. So simply put, you remember when we talked about square root of negative one, the imaginary numbers? Basically, it's all the numbers that you know of except that one and all of its friends. So it's all the real numbers. So all integers and integers are whole numbers and natural numbers, positive and negatives, um, and then fractions, and then all the irrational numbers. Irrationals are all those that can't be written as a fraction. So all those numbers that are real. So what we're saying up here, oh, sorry, one more. This vertical line, uh, it's not just a separator. That's the, this vertical line is called such that or when. Uh, so let me read this again in set notation. So we're saying that uh, my domain, it's the set. So, okay, so my set starting, the set of x's or all x's such that, so this tells me so far that I'm talking about x. I'm like, okay, so I'm talking about the x's and then such that, so I'm saying when something is happening. So when what's when what is happening? When x is inside or not in, but is a part of, a member of, or an element of the real number set. So every time x is real, then that is a part of our domain that is in the domain. So basically it's saying all real numbers. Same thing for that y. So it's all numbers, but those imaginaries. All right, so let's move on. So that's our, let's linear functions. We know its name, its formula, uh, or not its formula, sure. It's equation form, uh, the table and the graph. Let's move on to the quadratic function. Oops, going crazy. There we go. So quadratic is x squared, as you can see. So I'm just going to change this to a square. Um, and we have our, our quadratic. And I already have my points labeled here. Um, so let's look at some of these. So if I plug in a 0, it should be no surprise that out pops a 0. So that's 0, 0. If you want to, if you, if you like have this drawn, you can start making a table and put a 0, 0 in the middle. And then if I plug in a 1, I get 1 squared, because that's 1 squared is 1. 2, I plug in 2, we get 2 squared, which is 4. Plug in a 3, 3 squared is 9. So that's how that works. And this keeps going forever and ever and ever. Um, so it's going to keep going forever to the right. So that should give you a clue about our domain. And then it can plug in negative numbers as well. And if, anytime I square a negative, it becomes positive. So negative 1, 1. Negative 2, 4. Because negative 2 squared is a positive 4. Negative 3, 9. Because negative 3 squared is positive 9. So it gives us a nice smooth curve this U shape. Let me zoom in on on this. Notice how smooth this is here. So I'm graphing from basically you can see here from negative one to one, nice and smooth. It basically goes flat, not almost like it really goes flat horizontal uh, at the bottom of that. It is not uh, pointy. Uh, it is nice and smooth. So make sure that we're not drawing uh, straight lines or anything like that. So if you're looking at these from negative one to one, just an interesting little note. The reason why this is nice and smooth down here is because if you were to square a number between negative one and one, it actually gets closer to zero instead of bigger. Um, so let's take half, for example. So if I take half and square it, so one half times one half, so it's one times one is one and two times two is four, I get one fourth. And that's exactly what Desmos says here. Uh, so it's 0.5 and goes up only 0.25. All these other numbers, they actually get bigger. So when I plug in a 2, it's actually further away. But all these from negative 1 to 1, it actually gets closer to 0. All right, so that's our parabola. Um, our domain, like we saw, it's going to go from, um, from negative infinity all the way to positive infinity. 
So it's all of our x's, but our y values, so it's, it's going to go up and up and up forever and ever and ever, but we don't have anything below the x-axis. So it's going to go from, in terms of interval, from 0, so right here at 0, all the way up to infinity. So let's put this on our graph and make our table. All right, so here's our table. Um, it's those dots that we just saw. And then our domain and range, or our domain should be familiar. Like I said, it's all real numbers, or negative infinity to infinity. Um, but our range, it's going to uh, start at zero. Its, small, its lowest value is zero, and then it's going to go forever and ever and ever up to infinity. Or we can also say in terms of in inequalities that it's uh, greater than or equal to zero. So uh, the, all of our y values, so remember these are this is our y-axis, all of our y values are at zero or greater. So they're both saying the same thing. All right, so let's put our dots on the page. Again, I like to start at zero, zero. So I'm going to hope, hopefully you have that table written down because I'm going to kind of zoom in over here. So I'm going to put a dot at zero, zero. And then I'm going to go at one, one, put a dot. And then two, four, put a dot. And then three, nine, put a dot. So at those three places, we'll have dots. And then Again, I like to start at 0, 0 and go positive, and then flip over and do the negatives. Um, the negatives are a lot easier because notice how I'm, what I'm doing right now is I'm looking at that line. There's a nice axis of symmetry of parabolas, and I'm just really just flipping it over. And so I said at 3, 9. One other just little trick about parabolas, um, and this is just a fact about the numbers within our table. So let me start at 0. And show you something so what's the difference between 0 and 1 as in like if you subtracted 1 minus 0 what do you get 1 what about from 4 to 1 what's its difference 4 minus 1 is 3 and then what about 9 minus 4 5 do you notice that pattern of numbers over there it goes 1 3 5 the next one's gonna be 17 when this gets up to 4 16 oh I misspoke 7 you 7 I had the teens on my brain because of the 16. Um, so notice that it has those odd number skips. So you can uh, use that to your advantage of you know, going up one, then up another three, up another five uh, because of those odd numbers. All right, and then now let's swoop it. So I'm, I'll start up here, go through my dot, go through the other dot, and then when it crosses through at zero, zero, it goes horizontal for just a moment, and then I kind of missed the dot, so I'm going to back up and try again, because I can do that, because this is digital, and swoop through. Uh, and then make sure that we have our arrows, so it's nice and smooth and connected, and then most importantly, add those arrows. So there's our parabola uh, with its, uh, its name, its equation, table, there's the graph, and then our domain and range. All right, so now let's take a look at the square root function. So I've went ahead and typed in a square root of x. Um, you can use, there's some uh, keyboard keyboard commands down here that you're able to select. So there's the square root right here. Um, I just typed in SQRT and it changes it for me. All right, so hmm, let's look at this. So we had these dots that we've been graphing, basically the uh, from negative 3 to positive 3 of those integers. But this these dots don't seem too helpful. I get... Uh, 0, 0, 1, 1, that's cool, those two are nice. But then what's going on with 2 and 3? So if I plug in a 2, what is 1.414? Well, the square root of 2 is approximately that 1.414. The square root of 3 is that 1.73 here. So these are the square roots. Now, I'm not going to be expecting that you graph these decimal approximations of square roots. Ew, gross. Let's go back to x squared. And there's a relationship between square roots and squares. We're going to have lots of discussion about it uh, in the coming lectures um, when we talk about inverses. But we should already have an understanding that squares and square roots undo each other. If I have a square root and I want it to go away, I can just square, square it and the square, square root will go away. Or if I have a square root and I, if I have a square rather, and I square root it, 
uh, then the square will go, will go away. So uh, let's look at our points here. So I see 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 4, and 3, 9. So I bet if I plug in an x for the 4 and a, a, a 9 that, and a 9 also for my x, so if I use my x values of 0, 1, 4, 9, I bet we're going to get something nice. So let me switch this back to the square root of x. And I already have those prepared here. So I have 0, 0, uh, 1, 1, 4, 2, and 9, 3. Now you should understand something about 0, 1, 4, and 9. Those numbers are, I think I can hear you saying it, they are perfect squares. So 0, 1, 4, 9, next one would be 16, 25, 36. Those are the perfect squares. So in terms of graphing it for me, what I want to see, uh, when you do your, when you make parent functions, I want to see uh, these dots: 0, 0, 1, 1, 4, 2, and 9, 3. So, in terms of domain and range, I, my graph is starting. So, I'll be, I will, will be putting an arrow over here on the right, but I will not be putting an arrow at 0, 0. It starts at 0, 0, and then takes off. So, starts at 0, 0, then takes off. Uh, so that means that my domain does not have any of these negative numbers. It just goes from zero to infinity. All right. Uh, or you can say that zero is greater than X. The Y's, so I'm just looking at the Y's, it doesn't have any of these values. It's just from here up. This is kind of one of the, we'll talk more formally about domain and range a good bit later. Uh, but one way that I think about when I think about domain and range is think about if you have a subject, standing on the coordinate grid and you're wanting to or imagine just if you take a picture and you're trying to post it to social media and you're wanting to crop it so that way it's kind of just focused and featured on them and and then you could even go almost more extreme and crop it just right on them uh, that's kind of what you're doing in the graph is you're telling me where would you crop it horizontally that's the domain and where would you crop it vertically that's the range here, we're still going to be going out to infinity, so it's a little awkward because you're not cropping it ever. You're saying it's going to go out forever. Uh, but you're saying, okay, so crop it up to here because there's nothing down here. Crop it all the way over to here because there's nothing there. Um, and so it's just kind of what's happening over here. So that's kind of what, that's how I think of domain and range as well, is cropping it. So when you crop it horizontally, that's domain. Cropping it vertically, that's the range. All right, so let's, let me uh, copy all this down. All right, so we have our table. I filled in 0, 0, 1, 1, 4, 2, 9, 3. Uh, notice if I tried to plug in like negative 1, square root of negative 1, that is just simply, if we're talking, talking about real numbers, that's undefined. Uh, we do know that that's the imaginary number, but that's in terms of real numbers, that's undefined. We, I can't put that on the graph. Only real numbers belong on this graph. So um, we're just going to not graph it. So we're not, we're not even going to have that be a part of our, a part of our tables. All right. Um, so then, like I said, here's our, here's our domain and range, uh, starts at zero and then takes off in terms of the X direction. Same, same thing with the Y starts at zero and then goes up. All right. Uh, oh, and then this is our first time. No, last time we did see the inequalities, but we do have these, have these inequalities here, um, that is helping us out with this range. Um, I do have this note about the range's full name. Uh, I didn't put this last time, but it's that full name would be that, that it's a set of y's such that y is a real uh, is in the real number set and also y is greater than zero so it's there is an implied understood that we're talking about real numbers um, so that's why um, I'm not requiring you to have this but there's technically this little piece there all right let's put our dots down so make sure uh, I'm about to zoom in so you're not going to see those anymore so I'm going to put on zero zero this time it's really obvious that, I'm, that, that that's where to start. And then one, one. And I'm not gonna worry about two or three. Like we said, we're just gonna skip those. I mean, I do know that at two, it's gonna be just a bit less than half and three is gonna be just a little bit over half. That might help me make, make a nice smooth curve. And then four, two. So I go over four, one, two, three, four, up two, one, two, and put my dot. And then nine, three. This should feel very familiar if you turn your head or turn your paper, it looks like half of a parabola. Quite literally, that's what it is. All right, now it is starting at, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to make my graph. 
it's starting at zero and then going off smoothly oop was a little bit too high smoothly going through our points and it is still going up okay so i have my arrow okay um, but let me show you some things that students do that, are, that would be wrong so one they try to keep going in the in that, in that direction but there's nothing that way and i know they do that because they often will, will put arrows also be careful don't be sloppy and like do this and where you have notable graph to the left of that dot even if you don't put an arrow on it uh, make sure it notably starts at that zero zero then they'll hit this last dot and then they'll just go horizontal that's a problem or they hit, they'll hit this last dot and sort of kind of like do a weird extreme swoop up or they won't put the arrow at all so make sure that it's smooth and make sure it does keep going up nice and slowly all right so there is the uh, parent function for the square roots make sure to know it again by name by table its picture oh sorry by name here and then its equation all right next up is the cubic function so that is the uh, formula that is or the equation is x cubed so I have went ahead and typed that in um, and we have our have our dots here so again I'm going to plug in an x qubit and that's my output so I plug in a zero qubit you get zero plug in a one qubit you get one plug in a two two times two is four times two is eight so that's two eight if I cube a negative it stays negative so negative one cubed is negative one and negative two cubed is eight notice it's uh, has the same numbers they're just negative now like the square is the same numbers it was just flipped over these are the same numbers but they're just now spun down because uh, it's negatives cubed stay negative it's gonna I can plug in a million I can plug in a negative million I can I can go from negative infinity to infinity and especially when I had a million cubed it's gonna be really really high so it's domain is negative infinity to positive infinity and so is the range so let's uh, let's write all this down all right so here's our cubic function uh, by name by equation uh, that there's our table that we need to know you need to know these dots so as these fit in negative 10 to 10 if you were to do 3 the next one would be would be 327 so it gets pretty steep pretty quickly um, so uh, obviously you're not going to be graphing that unless uh, we start shrinking things which we will do later this week all right then uh, our domain and range like I said it's those all real numbers or negative infinity to infinity so let's quickly graph the dots so at 0 0 we at 0 0 then 1 1 then over 2 1 2 up 8 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 I'll have a dot here and then again like I said we allow negatives so if I square if I cube negative 1 we're at negative 1 and if I cube negative 2 we're now down here at negative 8 so here are my dots all right and so now I just need to swoop it so I come up a little bit too far it's basically it's not vertical but it's not too far off because remember the next dots uh, the next dots would be at uh, negative 3 negative 27 it goes to that dot and again it's nice and curvy kind of like an S let me zoom in over here so you can see that detail look how flat that that gets Okay, so don't be trying to go through this pretty straight or at an angle it's even flatter than the parabola all right and then it goes on up Oop, it's not quite curvy enough it goes on up 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 like so and then arrows on both sides both ends so that is our cubic function our next function is a cube root function now I've left up the cubic graph over here in Desmos just so we can take a look at it you know how squares and square roots are related well cubes and cube roots are also going to be related as well so look at the y values that I, that I can get uh, lost those let me try that again let's get these y values in here there we go so look at my y values negative 8 negative 1 0 1 and 8 I'm going to sort of kind of give it away that's going to be our x values if I was to switch this to the cube root the cube root of x these dots aren't very helpful again we'd be getting a uh, cube root so the cube root of 2 is one about approximately 1.26 cube root of 3 is about 1.442 that's not very informative for this graph uh, so I'm going to include uh, the basically just take our cube cube dots 
cube function dots and just swap them. So if you notice so far, um, there's in terms of like learning things, if you as long as you know the perfect squares, you know the you know the parabola or the the quadratic function, and then you just swap them and just do the positives for the square root. If you know your cubes, or at least the first three, 0, 1, and 2, then you know the cubic function, swap it, and now you know the cube root function. Right? And then for the linear function, it's just the same numbers, just 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3. So uh, not too hard to be memorizing. So again, let me uh, point out these ordered pairs. And that is what we said. So it's at 0, 0, 1, 1, 8, 2, and then the negative counterparts. And then again, domain and range can go for negative infinity to infinity on both because I can just keep plugging in bigger and bigger x's and smaller and smaller, uh, smaller and smaller x's. And it will be moving up. It just won't be moving up as much. But I could find a number that I could plug in to get to a million. It's, uh, it's just going to be bigger than it would have been with the cubes. So let's, docu let's write all this down in our notes. All right, so here's my cube root function by name, by equation, by table, uh, and then we'll be doing the graph in just a second. And like I said, with our domain and range, negative infinity to positive infinities. Um, so let's graph these, let's plot these. Again, if you know your cubes, then you just got to switch them in your brain. So let's start with 0, 0, and then 1, 1, and then not 2, but all the way over to 8. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and then up 2, and I'm, and I'm going to have a dot there. So let's put the dot there. Right, it's At this point with these three dots, it's kind of like the square root, but just shorter. And then negative 1, negative 1, negative 8, negative 2. So those are the dots that we get from our table graphed. Now we just need to swoop it. So again, it comes, uh, make sure like it's, it does not, like again, 27 is way over here, but make sure we don't do something extreme like that. Do you see that loop I just put in there? That is incorrect. So make sure that uh, if it is flat, that's okay, but make sure it does not uh, swoop up any incorrectly. This almost gets vertical, not quite actually vertical, but almost vertical. There we go. So there is our uh, our cubic function. Make sure that we don't get too crazy and we swoop and we do that. Um, if we're doing the cube root fun the cubic function, let me actually swoop up to that real fast. On this one, I just back on the cubic wanted to remind you it's real tempting by students. They don't mean it probably, but they'll like. Do you see how my pen like trailed back accidentally? Uh, they're probably just like doing this with their wrist uh, and so they'll get a little bit picky they'll do that but the problem with this is now that's all of a sudden not a function anymore and it's making it look like that is going back over itself even more extreme so do be careful about that let me pop back over to the cube cube root all right so, so you should be able to see that relationship between the cube and the cube root um, their x and y's are just literally switched of each other uh, and just a note about how to write this, that remember that this is the cube root of x with a floating 3 right here. Um, and then you can, you can also write this in uh, as a rational exponent, just like you can write the square root of x as x to the 1 half. You can write the cube root as x to the 1 third. All right, this is the absolute value function. Uh, to type this in on the keyboard, like below the backspace, there's a vertical line that you can draw, that you can type in. Um, or you can find it right above this ABC right here. You can click that and then pop in your um, your uh, the absolute value. So that is the absolute value. Then that vertical line on the keyboard, that's that same vertical line that's such that or win um, in the set notation. That's where that is on the keyboard. All right, so let's look at, take a look at this. So we're here call absolute value. Sometimes students have a incorrect understanding of this. It does not switch signs. That's times negative one. If I have x and then just multiply it times a negative, that would change signs. It would make a positive negative and a negative positive. Absolute value does not do this. The definition of, of absolute value is that it is the distance away from zero. So what this does uh, is, uh, if you think if I am standing at the number seven, I am now I'm seven units away from zero. If I'm standing at the number three, I am three units away from zero. It's a distance away from zero. 
So at minimum, you can think of it as like it makes numbers positive or makes them positive. But once it's simplified, once you're done with all the things. So uh, if, notice if I plug in a one, a two, or a three, out pops a one, two, or three. It's quite literally just like that line idea. But when I plug in a negative one, it's now a positive one. If I plug in a negative two, it's now a positive three. And a negative three, or sorry, negative two, positive two, negative three, positive three. I think I misspoke there for a second. So we have our, that's how we get our ordered pairs, especially these negative ones. So let's uh, take these points and graph them, put them on the table. All right, so I copied over, over our ordered pairs onto our table. I just did negative two to two. Again, feel free to do more and your lines need to be accurate all the way out to 10, uh, negative 10 to positive 10 um, on your grid. So if you need to add a few more dots like I will in a second, uh, then so be it, then do that. But um, that's how this works. Uh, I just at minimum need those. And then just to note, I didn't say this earlier, but make sure that your absolute value lines are slightly longer um, than kind of the line. It's a little bit taller, a little bit, little bit longer, so they don't look like ones or L's or something like that. They don't get confused, so they stand apart, kind of like about the height of a bracket sort of a thing. All right, um, so our domain, uh, it's just, um, just like the parabola, as it's negative infinity and positive infinity because it goes forever in both directions, but our range, it's uh, starting at zero because there aren't any negatives uh, and then goes up. So zero to infinity uh, or y, uh, y is greater than or equal to zero. And again, no square brackets here uh, and then the equal twos. I don't think I said this earlier, but the reason why we have parentheses around the infinity is because you can't ever get to infinity. You can always add one, you can always add 12, you can always multiply it times two, you can always square the number and it's just gonna get even bigger, even bigger, even bigger. You're never gonna make it to infinity. All right, let's graph. So I'm going to put in my points 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 2, and then negative 1, 1, negative 2, 2. Now, again, because I'm drawing these lines and this is going to go out, I'm going to add 5, 5, and then 10, 10. There we go. And then negative 5, positive 5, and then negative 10, positive 10 is over my writing, but it'll be okay. All right, and then let's uh, do our line. Arrow. Arrow. So make sure that we have our arrows there. Um, make sure that it's there. it does hit a corner. If I zoom in on this, uh, it is not a smooth curve. There's a corner that it turns, and in fact, literally right here, it's at a right angle, right? So it does turn a corner. It's a sharp corner, unlike the parabola, which is a smooth curve. So make sure that you see that corner there. Make sure we have those arrows, and make sure that it is accurate all the way. I'll, see, I'll have students, they'll give me these dots, and then they just sort of kind of do this, or they give me those dots, and they sort of kind of accidentally turn and then do weird things. Make sure that it's accurate all the way out to the end of the graph. One more graph, and we're done. All right, we're going to talk about the rational function. Some people also call it the reciprocal function. Uh, reciprocal because it's we just take x and we flip it, so it's now 1 over x. Or rational because it's uh, dealing with fractions. So 1 divided by x. And when you type in the division, it gives you the nice fraction bar uh, over here on Desmos. All right, so looking at these dots, they're not bad. Uh, they give us uh, 1, 1, 2, half. And 3, this is a third. Let's think about this. Let's think about this, because if I plug in a 2 into the x, I now suddenly just have 1 half. don't have to do any other simplification. I get 1 half. Now let me plug in a 3 in that denominator. Yep, and there's a 3, right? But I kind of want to have a, I kind of want to know what's happening here. I want a few more dots. So let's figure out what's happening if I plug in a half. So if I divide by a half, dividing by a half is the same thing as multiplying times the reciprocal. So it's 1 divided by 1 half, which is 1 times 2. So that's just 2. Um, we can also think of it as the reciprocal function. And if I have the number 1 half and I say reciprocate it, notice we end up with 2. So it's the reciprocal function. So uh, Or the ra that rational function, we can also think of it as reciprocal. So I'm going to use these dots. I have half 2 which the, there's a little bit of a pun there. It's like my students are like, oh, do I have to? <laughs> do you have 
to. Yes, you have to. So you have to graph half to, half comma two. So yes, do that. Graph half to and two halves. Uh, and then the and then we have the dots over here on the other side. I lost them. I'll get them back. Maybe. Sure, they're all, all over the place, but those are the dots. So let's get those graphed over. Oh, one more, one more important point. What about zero? What happens if I plug in zero? One over zero. Uh, yeah, remember one over zero? That is not okay. That is a big old no-no. So remember my, my mnemonic. If I have something over some number, that's fine. Sorry, if I have zero over some number, that's fine. That is okay. That is just zero. That's all good. But if I have some number and I divide it by zero, that is a no-no, that is undefined. So here we are dividing by zero. That is a no-no, so that is undefined. So let's write this down. All right, so we have our table here. Um, so it's those those same six dots now, but notice it's very similar. It's a half two, yes you do, half two, one, one, and two half, and then they're just negative, um, or negated, I guess I should say. And then I am noting that zero is undefined. It's the only value that is not permissible here. So zero is undefined. Uh, so in terms of my domain, well, my domain might be obvious. You might be able to see because um, our graph, the zero is not permitted. Zero is not allowed. Uh, as you can see over here on this left-hand side, where we, let me get rid of all these dots. Uh, as the X's get bigger and bigger and bigger, the uh, Y's, are getting smaller and smaller, but not just any kind of smaller, but like closer to zero. So when you make it to one tenth, um, it then becomes, uh, sorry, when you make it to 10, it's now one tenth. So if I was to go out to 100, that would be 100th. A million, that would be a millionth. Do you see how close that is to zero? Uh, but it's never gonna just pass over and become zero. Um, so it's always gonna be approaching and getting closer and closer, 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 closer to zero, but never touching. So the range is also from negative infinity all the way up to zero. You pick up your pencil, hop over zero, and then move on. So this is a really important one about when you want to think about bookends. All right, let me graph, let me get this graphed on this on my paper, and then I'll talk about domain and range again. Oh, actually, no, I'll come back. I'll go and say this, that I want to talk, uh, I'm going to put our asymptotes on here. So this is a term, these are lines that are guides or curves that are guides. Your vertical lines are are uh, guides that will never ever ever be crossed. Horizontal line, horizontal asymptotes, yeah, sometimes, but they're more guides um, for our graph. So there is a horizontal asymptote at uh, on the x-axis at y equals zero. So I'm going to graph a dotted yellow line, and then on my y-axis or uh, x equals zero, there's that vertical asymptote. I'm also going to go ahead and label that just so that way that's clear. So this is my abbreviated vertical asymptote at y equals zero and the horizontal asymptote ha at x equals zero. Oh, I have that backwards. My vertical asymptote at x equals zero, almost done. And my horizontal asymptote at y equals zero. Okay, so now let's graph our six points. So at, there's no zero, zero, so I'm just, I'm just going to start with the positive ones. I'm going to graph one, one, just so I can get it, get that anchor down, and then the twos. So it's half, two, and two, half. Oops, that's all the way up to the one. Two, half. Half, two, one, one, two, half. And then on the other side, negative half, negative two, negative one, negative one, negative two, negative half. Kind of makes like a pinwheel type looking thing. All right, so let's swoop this. So we're basically almost on the asymptote, if not almost, looks like it almost touches it. Then we come off of it, swoop to the dots, and then uh, right on down the other asymptote. Then the same thing here. Just on the north side, oops, let me undo that. Just on the north side of our axis, slowly coming off of it, swooping through your dots, and then riding up your other asymptote. 
there we go. Um, now I was what I was saying over here is don't be afraid to like not touch this. Like yes, technically I know this function does not touch those asymptotes. It does not touch the axes of the parent function. But look over here at Desmos. Desmos does a pretty good job of graphing, and doesn't it look like that it's touching? <gasps> For shame, Desmos, you're touching your asymptote. No, like there's it's graphing it with thickness. If I was to zoom in over here, zoom, zoom, zoom in, scooch over, look, it's not touching, right? But at this level of zoomness, I could scooch over long enough, and eventually it's going to look like that it's going to be touching again. And oh, look, oh no, Desmos, you're touching your asymptote again. What are you doing? Well, just zoom in some more, and it's going to, and then it's actually not touching. Now, can you zoom into this level of level of detail on your paper where each one of these little lines right here is? Um, well, this big line right here is 0.05, so this is 0.01. No, you don't have that level of accuracy on your paper. Um, but your our pens and pencils have thicknesses, so don't be afraid to, to get close to where it should be. The reason why I say that is I'll have students who will graph it like this. They'll graph, and they'll they'll be they're so afraid of getting too close to the asym uh, too close to the asymptote that they just sort of kind of graph these like capital looking L looking things. No, no, no. There are these smooth curves. They they always forever get closer, 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 closer. If it gets to a point that you can't graph a tenth without touching, then it's going to touch. It's going to be okay. Um, so let's talk about, again, the domain and range. Um, so I have all numbers. Uh, let's do domain first real fast. Uh, so um, again, imagine an industrial press almost done. Industrial press smashes down. Uh, so it's gonna. I'm gonna have stuff here. I'm talking about the x. I'll have things here. Have on the x. I'll be. It'll be. I'll have remnants of the rational function all the way here smashed. But then I'll pick up my pencil, hop over, and then move on. So just at zero, there's nothing. All right. So if I smash this with an industrial press, I'll have stuff all along the x-axis. Every single x number will have it. Every single x value will have a thing, except right there at zero. Everywhere else, there will be stuff, just not at zero. Same thing with the y. So if I bookend it, smash them uh, onto the y-axis, um, then I'll have stuff everywhere on the y-axis, just not at zero. Uh, so that's why we write it this way. So it's, te again, technically it's full name. It's is there is like a y is an element of the real number set uh, tucked in there that's assumed to be there. So not worrying about that. But then for our interval notation, uh, so I'm going from negative infinity Right, coming along, coming along, coming along, all the way up to zero. I get to zero, but don't touch it. Hop over it, and then go from zero to the other side. This big fat U is called union. Uh, it is not missing its tail. It is not just a regular capital U. It's a little bit extra fatter and special. Uh, but if for some reason you're typing it out and you can't find it, just use a regular U. But it is a little bit fatter U. So. It, it also means in some, oops, erasing things. In some contexts, it means or. So it's that idea is like the, or X could be here or X could be here. Uh, informally, I, I encourage students to think of it like glue. It just glues together the different, the different segments of the interval notation. So I have this piece and I have this piece. And this is just a little piece of glue that's holding them together. And again, the same thing happens on the Y. Negative infinity to zero piece of glue holding it together because we'll hop over the zero, zero to infinity. So this union does not have to be just a zero, just one one little unit size. It could be, you know, a whole host of large numbers. It's just a piece of glue that glues them together. So there we have it. There's our seven parent functions. I know it was a lot. I know I rambled. Um, but what you need to know is its name, the uh, equation, the table, and then its graph. If you're my student, uh, you're going to be doing a parent function quiz where it's, it's going to be a timed quiz based upon how long I told you. Uh, my expectation of it is that in that in the, within the time limit that you're able to graph all seven parent functions, you'll recognize them by their equation, and then you'll be able to graph them. And you don't have to give me this table because um, in a time test, a time quiz like that, it's hard to write down the table. If you want to, you can. But at minimum, I want the dots. If you don't give me dots, then I'm gonna need I'm gonna need somewhere need to know that you know what the points are. So you're gonna have to give it to me in a table form, or I would just say give me the dots. Those at those minimum dots. Um, so I need the dots. I need the uh, the graph. 
Um, and then for bonus points, uh, from, what I, from what I've talked about in class or in writing, as then if you give me the domain and the range. Um, you don't have to give me both forms, so just give me one form, but you can switch it up, don't really care which form you give it to me. Uh, if it is something like this where they're repeated, you do have to write it twice uh, for it to count. You can't just say it. it's the same thing for both. Um, so there you have it. There's our seven parent functions. If you're astute and you know of more parent functions, don't worry. We'll talk about exponentials and logarithm and logarithms later in the semester. But for now, these are our seven parent functions. Hope you know how to graph them. Practice, practice, practice. Just uh, do them over and over. Uh, if you have any questions, make sure uh, shoot me a line to, uh, to let me know. And I'll see you in the next video.